Hello everyone and welcome back to day two of Freak Week. Today's story is very creepy. It is not like anything I've ever heard of before and I am just dying to get your guys' opinions on it. Just want to remind you guys that the limited edition Freak Week shirt is now available. We actually have two shirts. These are the two options. I kind of did one for each type of, you know, personality and I think they turned out really good. And not only that, 20% of the profit from those shirts is going directly to Thorn, which is awesome. So that is linked below. But anyway, let's get right into it. Today I'm gonna to be telling you about the silent twins. Okay, so this is Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons, and they came from Barbados to England in 1960. Aubrey was in the Royal Air Force, so the two moved around together a lot. And then on April 11th of 1963, Gloria and Aubrey gave birth to twin girls. They named their girls June and Jennifer Gibbons. Now I've always been really interested in twins. I'm just fascinated by them. I've heard so many interesting stories about twins. I've even done videos on it before so I'll link them below but the connection that twins have has always been really amazing to me and it seems like some twins notice it and some don't but those who do describe an incredible bond between themselves and their twin and I'm curious if any of you out there are twins and you know what you think of that like do you feel like you had some type of secret bond or anything like that because June says that right from the start her and Jennifer knew they were twins before they were even you know old enough to understand what a twin was they always had this understanding understanding that they were split. They were two people split. They were identical twins and identical twins are normally the ones that describe having this incredible bond. Now what was really unique about these girls is that they were very, very hard to understand. They had a speech impediment and they really could only understand each other. I thought that was super interesting. Other people could never figure out what they were saying, but they could talk perfectly to each other. And I'm curious, like, how common is it for two twins to have the same speech impediment? I don't know if that like runs in twins or anything, but I thought that was really interesting that they both had the exact same thing going on. So obviously the girls had to repeat themselves constantly because no one understood them. So eventually both of them decided to stop talking. I have to say I actually did do this when I was a kid. I feel like a lot of kids probably did this where I said, oh, I'm not talking anymore. I'm not going to talk anymore. And it would last like 10 minutes to an hour max. But these girls kept this up for a very, very long time. And they're always shy, and they're not, you know, not speaking. Well, they spoke, but we couldn't understand what they were saying. So that's the trouble, and then when they knew that we couldn't understand, they went back in the shell, you know? Now what's really fascinating is somehow June and Jennifer ended up creating their own language. They would talk to each other in this language, but no one else could understand it. And this is actually a thing. There's actually a phenomenon where twins develop their own language. How did it feel for you that people couldn't understand what you were saying? A bit of frustrating, we had to repeat ourselves more often. And then we couldn't be bothered to repeat ourselves, we didn't speak. We left it. And they kept saying, what are you saying? What are you saying? And we just say, oh, you can't hear us now, you can't hear us never. So we decided not to speak, and we couldn't do a habit. In 1974, the family moved to Wales and lived in a RAF house. At this time, the girls were 11 years old. And once the girls started school, they were actually really good students, except for they didn't talk at all. Now, a lot of their teachers were really frustrated with them because they felt like they were well-behaved kids, they weren't causing trouble, they were smart, but they weren't communicating. And that was just so frustrating, especially to have two twins doing this. A lot of the teachers became extremely frustrated with them and also the other kids started picking on them, bullying them. People just thought they were super strange, didn't want to talk to them, and they were. They were creepy. Like, they freaked people out. The whole non-talking thing and the fact that there was two of them just really weirded people out. So people kind of retaliated back onto these girls. People said that they were completely emotionless, and whenever someone tried to talk to them or call their name or get their attention, they would completely ignore them and act like they didn't exist. It's like in their world the only person that exists was each other. Not only were they having these bullying issues because of their speech issues and the lack of talking, but they also were the only black girls in the school. The girls were definitely experiencing some hardcore racism, which made it even harder for them to get through their lives. That eventually the teachers had to have them start leaving an hour early than everyone else so that they could avoid the bullying. Now, obviously their parents wanted to know why their girls weren't talking. Teachers were concerned. Everyone wanted to know why. 
So their parents ended up taking them to a child psychologist, and that is where they were diagnosed with something called selective mutism. And selective mutism is a childhood anxiety disorder characterized by a child's inability to speak and communicate effectively in select social settings, such as school. These children are able to speak and communicate in settings when they are comfortable, secure, and relaxed. And even after the girls had a diagnosis, the school still didn't want to deal with them. People were fed up with it, they were frustrated, felt like they were purposely just not talking. So they ended up sending them to a special education school. And this school was actually a lot better for the girls. Um, their teachers understood that they weren't stupid, they were actually smart, they just had issues speaking, communicating. And that is where they actually figured out that the girls were not speaking their own language. They were just speaking English, but it was very sped up and hard to understand. Once a week, twice a day, once a month, once a year, no idea. Well, perhaps she planted it, first day of your life, and that was it. <laughs> Come on, you tell me, because I don't know. Every day. Jennifer and June went about their lives in school and when they weren't in school, they would go home, lock themselves in their room, and X themselves away from society. This is really, really weird, but they also had a sister named Rosie, a younger sister, and she shared her room with them. Dolls, dolls in the bedroom. For families. Mother doll, father doll, sister and brothers. I used to like playing dolls, I liked it. Yeah. We used to do things on the tape recorder, do um, plays. Dress up in clothes and all that. Yeah, I do. I'll get back here. I'll show you where I'm doing. It's nice dress. Thank you. Oh. Steps down down the steps. I'm seeing that big old door. Hi, Neil. <laughs> so nice to see you. Hi, you boy. You look smashing in those clothes. You look lovely in that dress. Don't you? You look lovely. So they would speak to her, but then when she turned 11, she moved into her own room and they stopped talking to her. These girls even had to eat and drink by themselves. They would not do it in front of anyone else and their parents would have to leave them alone in order for them to eat. Obviously, they couldn't really do this at school, so when they were at school, they would sit as close together as they could and they would eat in unison. And when the girls were home, to do anything fun like watch a movie or a TV show or anything like that, they had to ask their parents, like write a letter to their parents saying what they wanted to watch and when they wanted to watch it and they would set it up for them and they could watch it actually from the outside of their bedroom. Like they just sit in the hallway in front of their door and watch the TV downstairs. When the girls were 11 years old, they began to walk in sync with each other. Their steps were completely in sync with each other unless someone would walk by and look at them. And if they did, the girls would just completely stop and stare at them. And then they wouldn't start walking again until the person had left. So as you can tell, these girls really had the twin bond, but like on steroids. And weirdly enough, this was not something that they were happy about. They weren't trying to be bratty or rebel. They said that they had no choice but to act this way. They even wrote in their diaries about how they thought it would be a good idea for them to separate. They said in the diary that if they were to separate, they said this would give them the opportunity to live a normal life, eat, talk. So eventually it was decided that the girls would be separated. They would move away from each other in order to learn social skills and this way they would be able to become more independent. It would be a good idea if we separate. I think one should go and one should stay here. We act stupid when we're together. Some people think we don't want to separate but we want to because it really is the best thing for us. It would be good if we separate. We both fight for the best things. We're both willing to lead our own lives, but when we're together, we just keep depending on each other too much. The move ended up being a really hard thing on the girls, and they ended up stopping eating, stopping sleeping, they wouldn't dress, and they became catatonic. And if you don't know, catatonia is a state of psychomotor immobility and behavioral abnormality due to lack of critical mental function and in a level of consciousness, and a sufferer is almost entirely unresponsive. So obviously they decided that they had to bring them back together. This was only making matters worse having them separated. So they went back home, back to their room, not talking to anyone. At one point the girls even decided to buy like a course that teaches you how to communicate effectively with people, 
how to talk, and they did it, and the course didn't even help them. June said that they tried for a while, but they just weren't able to break their silence. And obviously, after years of this, it became so difficult for them, so difficult for the people around them, and the girls became depressed. But then they decided to channel all of their feelings into something, a way that they could express themselves. So they decided to start writing books. They figured that this could help them with their communication, you know, writing. By the summer of 1981, the girls had filled up several notebooks filled with writings. They even tried to get some of their work published. They actually at one point thought that they were going to make it really big. And unfortunately, these books did not do well. Their work barely got any attention, and this was really hard on them because they thought it was so good and it was really all they had to be hopeful about. So once that was gone, they became really depressed. When the girls were 16 years old, they actually met another pair of twins from America. They were actually two boys around the same age and the four of them ended up spending the whole summer together. And they kind of went a little crazy with these guys, started to party a little bit. They were able to get drunk, get a little looser than they were. The boys were kind of partiers. They liked to go to clubs and stuff like that. And after a while, things really got into tense with the boys and the girls started kind of arguing over them. You'd think that these girls were really, really close and loved each other a lot, and I think they did, but they had a really toxic relationship. They started to really get at each other's throats, um, actually literally, because Jennifer had a diary entry where she talked about how she tried to strangle June with a radio cord. At the end of this summer, the boys were forced to go back to America, and this was really, really hard on Jennifer and June. And they decided that they were going to take their anger out on society, that they were going to do something bad. And specifically, they wanted to do as much damage as possible. So that October, June and Jennifer went and burned down a huge store in their town. In June's diary, she talked about how proud she was, and she said that it was the best day of her life. She also mentioned that she was going to keep doing it until she got caught. And she said she wonders if maybe this will be the first Christmas that she spends in jail. And some Surprise, surprise, they did get caught and they did end up getting put in jail. And they actually caught them because of Jennifer's diary entry. That's how they were able to prove that they did it. So jail was pretty much hell for the twins. They would be put into a cell together, but they would end up fighting and would be separated. But when they were separated, they were practically paralyzed without one another. They like could barely function, walk, talk, speak, you name it. So they had to be kept together. So they kept putting them back together. And it's so weird because they literally hated each other at this point. They said that they hated each other and that they wished each other would die. Now doctors at the time started to believe that maybe they were in the early stages of schizophrenia and it wasn't full blown yet, but this ended up being not true. They were in fact never schizophrenic and the judges didn't really know what to do with them and they hated to just keep them in prison because they knew that if they did, they wouldn't get any treatment or help and this obviously is going to make it worse and probably would never allow them to ever have a hope of getting out one day. Doctors believed that they really need treatment, so it was decided that they were going to be staying at the Broadmoor Hospital indefinitely. At 19 years old, the girls entered the mental health facility, and they were not happy to be there. They said that there was way too many people there, they hated it, they felt stressed out, and this stressed out their family as well. And for the next two years after that, they were kept in the hospital in two separate wards, completely separate from each other, and they could write letters to their parents and to each other, but that was it. And in one of Jennifer's letters to June, she talked about how she knew she was going to die eventually. Well, obviously, but she knew she was going to die sooner than later, and sooner than her twin was going to die. Being separated, made the girls eventually start to hallucinate. It was that bad for them. And this is when they were diagnosed with schizophrenia, even though we know that they did not actually have it. And they were also given tranks, which June said made them eventually start to speak. But it also made them really foggy, like their memory just wasn't working right, their brain was slower than normal, they just felt like they were in a fog. And it was also too hard for them to even write because they couldn't see very well under these medications. Eventually the girls did start speaking and they thought that this would allow them to be released, but this was not the case. Every year they would have another court date and the judge would rule that they'd have to stay in there another year or two. So this went on and on and on until the girls had spent 12 years in the hospital. It started to seem like the judge just wanted to keep them in there because they were different. They were strange, they're weird and unpredictable. A month before the girls turned 30, they actually were transferred to a different hospital that had 
kind of a more laid back feel. It was less strict, they could relax a little bit more and they felt better in this place. But when they were leaving from the old hospital to the new hospital, Jennifer started saying how she didn't feel well. She had pain, she just felt super sick overall, and she actually told June that she knew she was going to die. Once they got to the new facility, they took her to the hospital. Shortly after she arrived, Jennifer died on March 9th. The cause of death was acute myocarditis, which is sudden inflammation of the heart. And this is something that is actually rarely fatal. So the fact that she died was super weird and she was super young. There was no evidence of drugs or poison in her system. She just died of natural causes. I mean, how weird is that? What are the chances of that happening? I mean, it's insane, especially the fact that she was predicting that she was going to die. There was no sign whatsoever of foul play in this death. And this is creepy, but June said when they were driving to the new hospital that Jennifer had her head laying down on June's lap and that she was sleeping, but with her eyes open. On Jennifer's tombstone, it says, we once were two, we two made one, we no more two, through life be one, rest in peace. And June actually wrote this poem for her tombstone before Jennifer even died. June stayed in the facility for about another year and she wrote in her diary all about her sister and how she was dealing with the grief of her sister but in a way she was actually relieved that she was gone and she felt like there was a weight lifted off her shoulder. She felt like she was finally free from this insanely tight and toxic relationship that she had with her sister. Now something is obviously up with these girls. I mean, I almost think it's something like something from a past life or some type of curse or weird thing where they're like split into two people but they are the same soul or something because this story is so wild to me. And the creepiest part about this whole thing is that June and Jennifer actually knew that one of them had to die in order for the other to have a good life. They said that if only one of them was alive, they'd be free from suffering. So this, I guess, was a blessing in disguise for June, and I guess for Jennifer too. And it started to kind of seem like Jennifer had planned her own death. On March 18th of 1994, they decided that they were going to release June from the facility. Feeling of total freedom. It's unbelievable that I'm actually going out in the big wide world, doing normal things that normal people do. I feel that I'm living for her. That this is what she would have wanted for me to go on living for her. And every day I wake up and say to myself, Well, there was one more day for me, but one, one more day for my sister as well. And I'm still alive. I feel that's a privilege, really. I mean, am I lucky or something to be still alive when she's gone? I thought, that, I thought I'd never get over her death, but it made me 10 times stronger. It took June a long time to process her sister's death and to stop feeling guilty about being the one that didn't die because she knew one of them had to, which I think is just so weird that the two of them knew that one of them had to die. I mean, can you imagine having that conversation with a twin or a sibling? It's just so weird to me. So this story is obviously bizarre as hell. I would love to know your guys' thoughts on it. Why do you think the girls weren't able to talk? Why do you think only one of them could live? Have you ever heard of anything like this before? Or what is the weirdest thing you've ever heard about like a twin pair that do something weird because I don't know twins are so interesting to me but anyway that's it for freak week for today be sure to tune in tomorrow and every day until October 31st for videos every single day on my channel this week don't forget to check out the freak week designs they are limited edition and will not be available forever and 20% of the profit goes to thorn but that's it for me today you guys stay spooky and I will see you next time